Hi, I'm Charles Martinet, and you're listening to Scene World Podcast. <laughs> It's a dog barking podcast. Yeah. It's the Scene World Podcast. I'm me. He's him over in Germany. How's it going? Very good. <laughs> I'm not allowed to say why. Yeah, well. <laughs> in, in a minute, we're going to be talking to uh, Ron Gilbert. He is the guy behind Thimbleweed Park, the new game that just came out. Um, he's also the guy behind Maniac Mansion and um, Monkey Island and a ton of other games that you probably know of and have played so that's going to be in a minute before that we have some game we we have some games yeah no we have some news we we have a we 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 have talking lessons coming up soon because i don't know how to do that apparently wow so i I thought you are the native english speaker and i'm apparently not okay okay so all right so the big news is of course, last podcast, we talked to Andreas Wallstrom, who was ma- writing a book called uh, Commodore 64 for the love of a machine, and that has been canceled. So, and, and canceled a week before it was actually going to be, a week before the, the Kickstarter was finished. So, I don't know if we want to talk about that at all. Well... Well, personally, I think it. No, better not. Let's not get into that. And, and, and Andreas released a statement saying that he wasn't, he wasn't uh, satisfied with how the Kickstarter was going. There was still a week. There was still a, a full seven days left before it ended. He had raised about two thirds, I think, of what he wanted to raise, and and he said that he was going to to end the the campaign based on that. So it's disappointing because uh, I feel like solutions were available to it. And, you know, we've seen this before doing this for the amount of years we've been doing that. Like, sometimes Kickstarters don't work the first time. You know, sometimes you got to do it two or three times. Sometimes um, a lot of funding doesn't come until the last week or so because people want to see that what they're contributing to is probably going to be made right yeah and sometimes you have to work out permissions to use stuff that's also known by other kickstarters right. so right. that's all not new stuff uh, just an example david Lowe actually had to restart his uh, kickstarter two times so yeah. he actually yeah when we did talked to him times. that was the that was the third time he ran that when we spoke to him and, right and so, it was that time that it, that it got funded so i mean so based on that, I hope that he decides to give it another go because, you know, it was, it was a it was a cool looking book. It was it, well done, and I, I, I would hate to see it not get put out. I'd hate to, to see it not get a chance to get put out. Um, but you know, we'll we'll see what the future holds. Hmm. Right. Um, other news. Um, the sixty four again, who we spoke to, a few podcasts back. Yes, Darren Mailburn. Yes, they've announced that they have secured a worldwide manufacturer and distributor. Uh, they have not said who that manufacturer and distributor is. Um, their statement reads, um, "Is fantastic news for the product, in particular the backers of the Indiegogo campaign, as they apparently fell short of the campaign funding target, which slowed progress. With this global partner, they have the missing infrastructure and backing to complete the projects without having to secure more funding. Um, and this comes from a, an article on Flickering Myth, and we'll put a link to that in the podcast description if anyone wants to look at it. Um, so that is... That's cool to see that going. I'd like to know more information on it, but I guess they have to finalize the agreement before they're going to announce who it is. Um, along those same lines, 
Um, we've talked about the uh, the ZX Spectrum ZX. I can, you know, I understand it's a British computer, and and they say it's it's the ZX. That's how it's said it, over there. And that's when they invented it. Then they designed it. It was intended to be called the ZX Spectrum. But I feel as if I am. Um, I feel as if I'm almost betraying my Americanness by not calling it the ZX Spectrum. Should I say it because no, 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 I I'm... learned British English? I can say ZX without <laughs> I, I feeling I can say good. ZX too. It just feels weird to say it because I look at the, the word on here and it's ZX. And that's I don't understand where Z came from specifically because because Z Z doesn't fit within the rest of how the letters are named, you know. But, B but and C, C and D. C but B uh, but C and C are sounding very similar to me uh, as a foreigner. Uh, I guess. I guess. Uh, either way. Try it, try it out. How do you say A, B, C? A, B, C. And how do you say the last letter of the alphabet? Z. Z it's for me the same Z thing. Z and C. It's a, it's a hard oh, gosh. Z, Z. Try to figure that out over the telephone. <laughs> Impossible. Yeah, so I, I guess, prefer Z. I I guess. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we've we've talked a little bit about the Vega Plus and stuff. Let's never talk about that again because it's awful. But a new Kickstarter has been announced for the ZX oh, yes, Spectrum I saw that. Next. Uh, yes, yeah. and they were trying to raise three hundred and twenty-three thousand dollars, and they have raised four hundred and twenty-one thousand. So they have blown away the the. Um, their goals. I mean, they've shot past it, and it's not over yet. Um, it's an updated and enhanced version of the Spectrum. It's supposed to be totally compatible with the original. Uh, it was designed by Rick Dickinson, who also designed the original one. So, that is a glimmer Very of light. Promising. It's yeah. a glimmer of light on the ZX Spectrum horizon that we can, that we can be uh, excited about, even though I've never used a, a, a Spectrum, and I don't know if you ever have, but no, no, it wasn't so popular in Germany yeah, either. It's, it's kind of outside the purview. I they I was peripherally aware of them existing in the U.S. I don't think they were called. I think they were Sinclairs or, or there. No, they were, they were Timex. Timex made them here. Um, but I, I saw them in magazines, but I never actually touched one or used one. Uh, it sounds a bit like a time machine. Yeah, but so there's a time Kickstarter like page. Um, it's a long URL. I'm not going to say it because there's no point, but I'm going to we'll put a link to the description. So if you want to go to the Kickstarter and back it and check out what they're doing, do that. It'd be awesome. Um, so yeah, there's that. What else we got? You have anything? Yeah, well, uh, Claw Hunter unfortunately doesn't, didn't get funded on the Kickstarter. But they announced in an update that was only for bakers, at least from the heading that I saw, that was just the beginning. So they are obviously not giving up. Anyway, I still decided to put up our Let's Play of mm -hmm. the pre-alpha version of Ultras, AJ and me, though Martin. So you can watch at this right now and um, on our YouTube channel, youtube.sceneworld.org. Also, a lot of people asked me, when are you coming out with a new Scene World issue? <laughs> and we just did that on the 26th of April. The new Scene World issue is out, Scene World 27. So download it on sceneworld.org or have, have a look at it on the emulator or even on your real C64 or on the homepage itself. Mm -hmm. So consume it the way you want. And we already got a very much a positive feedback and excitement from the scene. Thanks very much for that. So at this point, I want to especially thank yeah. our yes. um, newest members, Martin and Martin, who actually did it for the first time and Oliver jumped in and made it for the first Oliver time. Oliver bent over backwards to, to put it all together. Yep, yep. So a lot of people actually were involved in creating and putting together a new issue and did that for the first time. Even me. Yeah, even I don't, a shame. I don't do that. I, usually I don't focus on the, the magazine part of it. I, if I write something, I, I give it over, and that's the last I look at it. And, and I actually had to 
to break out some some coding with this one. Yeah, on the emulator front yeah. for the web version. So. He, he did he did the new um, Steam World graphic when you load it in the yeah. web. So thanks for that, guys. Yeah. So despite it wasn't perfect because there were some issues in this issue, um, people li liked it, and we will try to. Well, to not have the 28 coming in a year, but sooner, hopefully. Yeah. Let's hope for that. So, check it out oh. on steamworld.org. Yes. I, I've got something here. Um, back, a lot of our news is focusing on people that we've talked to in the past um, few years. So, in podcast number 12... Jurg, I don't think I was there. Maybe I was. The Aquinox, Deep Descent. Yes, of course it was with you. Yeah, yeah. Because you said... That's right. What's, what's, what's interesting about this game as a perspective from a person who never played the yeah, series? Yeah. Okay, so so Aquinox, Deep Descent. We talked to them, uh, the, the guys behind that, uh, podcast number 12 all those t years ago. Um, they are getting ready for a release. I got a thing in my email. Uh, because I guess I backed them, although I don't remember doing that, but okay. Um, and there's no back for Mac version, so I couldn't do anything with it. But they just had a multiplayer event from April 6th to May 1st, so it's over now. Uh, but backers got a Steam key and were able to try out the multiplayer aspects of the game for that amount of time. So that's that's pretty cool because it's been... We talked to them and, and, and we got a lot about the development of the game and, and where it was going. And that was, you know, two years ago or, or so. Actually, last year I had an update. I met with Norbert Rogar, who's mm -hmm. the lead engineer and CEO of the company Digital Hour. And he actually had an interview with me about 15 minutes. Oh, that's right. That's right. And I played an early demo. So you can see that also on our YouTube, youtube.seamworld.org. If you go to the. Um, to the Gamescom 2016 playlist, right. you will see the interview with uh, Norbert Varger, and I think it was the best interview of the whole whole <laughs> Gamescom event. That's right. That's well, how did I that, I that that I conducted. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. So so if you want to check that out, it's it's www.aquinox.com. Uh, you can go there and and look at the game and see what it is, and and you know potentially you can pre-order from Steam as well, I believe. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful game. Oh. You have to you have to know um, that it was actually a German game originally released by a Blue Buy software was called Schleichfahrt, <laughs> and it, it was called what? Schleichfahrt. Schleichfahrt. Yes. So slow driving. Oh, we okay. also we also um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's on that in the podcast yeah <laughs> so slow uh, driving yeah yeah life fart yeah that's what I'm gonna call yeah. next time I'm on the road and someone's driving real slow in front of me I'm just gonna lean out the window and yell slice fart exactly 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 yeah so um so this is a very very gay I'm a very a game I look forward to very much. Oh, God. You have to cut that out. Um, okay. Sorry. So that's a game I look forward to very much. Yes. Because I love to play it as a teenager, like, in 1996, so 21 years ago. Yeah. Actually, in this in this podcast, we talk a lot about 20 years ago. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the whole gist of why we're here is because of stuff we did 20 years ago. Right. But, you know. Right. And lastly, on my list of things that we can talk about, um, October 20th to 23rd on Royal Caribbean's Majesty of the Seas, it's a big cruise line, um, will be the Gamer Gauntlet Cruise, and Vanessa Ortega will be there on the cruise. So. Wow, I didn't know that one. There you go. So. Ooh. Yeah. Look who, who came prepared this week. <laughs> Oh, very good. So, very good. <laughs> so, if you're a gamer, if you're interested in going on the Gamer Gauntlet Cruise on this ginormous Royal Caribbean Majesty of the Seas boat, you can go to 
GamerTechEvents.com. Again, link down in the podcast description, uh, and you can sign up for it and, and book for it. I don't know. I, uh, so interior cabins are running at $750 per person. Ocean view cabins are running at $995 per person. So if you have that laying around, why not? <laughs> and and you'll be going to to the, the cruise will be going to Port Canaveral, Florida. Well, it'll be yeah, Port Port Canaveral in Florida. Uh, the Nassau, the Nassau, yeah, Nassau Bahamas, uh, and and Coca Cay Bahamas. So. <laughs> And there'll be, you know, live entertainment, esports tournaments. Uh, Which is, I guess, the reason why Vanessa is there. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, there's lots of, uh, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff to do. Lots of people to see. Cosplay, exhibitions and panels. Hey, I mean, if you win the tournament, you actually get it get it for free. Because from the prize money, you can pay there you go. the cabin. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. So, you know, check it out again. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, well, we'll get, g- gamer tech events, did I just say? What? Yeah, g- ga- gamer tech? One again, tech? it's gamertechevents.com. Okay. So check that out. I understood gay gamer tech event. That would be a totally different cruise. <laughs> so anyway, Ron Gilbert is over there. Well, so thanks for taking the time, Ron, to talk to us today. Sure, my pleasure. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's uh, great. It's it's two years since we met on Gamescom. Since since you tracked yeah. you down and harassed you. <laughs> so so today we are talking to you, Ron, because you recently released a new point-and-click graphics adventure, that would be Thimbleweed Park. Correct, that is true. So, let's start a bit earlier, actually. How did it happen that you actually started with designing computer games? I mean, you are mostly known for Maniac Mansion and inventing the Scum Mansion, but I guess there must be something that was before. Yeah, I mean, I started out, you know, when I, when I first learned to program... Yeah, I was probably, I guess, 13 or 14 years old. And, you know, I started out, you know, going down to the local arcades, you know, because we actually had arcades back then where you put quarters in the machines. And I would just go down there and I would look at those games and then I would come home and I'd I'd really just try to replicate them, you know, on on my computer. And I think that was, you know, the easiest way to kind of get into game design is to you know, try to replicate what someone else is doing. And then, you know, after I would do that, then I would start to change them a little bit. You know, I start to add things that were different from the design. And, and that's really where I, you know, I kind of got into designing games and stuff was just, was just doing a lot of that, you know, and then I started creating my own games, but you know, they were very arcade style games. You know, they weren't, they weren't big adventures. I did, you know, I did a big RPG type game, you know, and got maybe 10% through it and then gave up just because I didn't realize how complicated it is to like build an RPG when you're 15 years old. Um, so I did that, but, you know, I think I also, you know, became really fascinated with, uh, languages, programming languages. And, you know, I, I did a program called graphics basic, which was for the Commodore 64, which went and took the, basic language that was embedded in the C64, which, you know, had absolutely no ability to take advantage of the graphics of the Commodore 64 without doing like peaks and pokes and, you know, syscalls into assembly language, which I thought was a shame because the Commodore had absolutely amazing graphics, but no way to actually access them through basic. So I created a program called Graphics Basic, which added a whole bunch of commands to the built-in basic language that allowed you to create sprites and sounds and, you know, all sorts of things. And I think that's where I got really interested in, you know, in, in languages, which really led to the development of the SCUM system. You know, I started doing that. So, you know, I was really just doing a lot of Commodore 64 programming, you know, and then I got a job at a company called Human Engineered Software that actually sold Graphics Basic to them. And they really liked it and offered me a job. So I went to work for them for about six months and then they went bankrupt. 
Um, and then, you know, a, a couple of weeks after that, I got a call from Lucasfilm because they were looking for somebody to port their Atari games to the Commodore 64. So that's really kind of how I how I got into it. But, you know, I was hired at Lucasfilm not as a game designer, but I was hired as somebody to do Commodore 64 ports. Okay, so basically what you did with the arcade games, porting it on your computer at home, you did for for money, but without changing the game and improving no, I, things, but... Yeah, I mean, I, did, I didn't do it for money. I mean, the stuff that I was doing at home, I was just doing for fun, right? I mean, I, I was in high school, and I was just doing that on the weekends for fun, learning how to program. You know, I didn't, I didn't make any money, you know, doing, doing programming until I went to work for this company and, you know, it had sold Graphics Basic to them. And that is how they actually got you hired? And that now, after that, you did what you did before as a hobby for for money, working on Atari conversions. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. I mean, I kind of, you know, there's this hobby. And I think you see that today, too, right? I mean, there's just a ton of indie developers who, you know, their hobby is designing and creating games. And then, you know, suddenly they turn it into a job. So I think, you you know, I just kind of went from this hobby thing to a job thing. Wow. And um, how was it for your surroundings back then? You see, I mean, a game developer mm, wasn't kind of, a, well, not normal you would say well well seen or well sophisticated job yeah no i mean it wasn't at all and i mean games really weren't right when i started doing games you know like in the early 80s and stuff the, you know most people didn't play games right i mean almost everybody plays games today in some fashion right on their phone and all this stuff back then very very few people played games and you know you people would would say well what do you do and i'd say oh i'm a game designer and then they would just kind of stare at you for a while because they didn't really understand what that even meant or you know if they had seen these arcade games you know at at the arcade or at the bowling alley or whatever it never occurred to them that people were behind these right these were just these machines that sat there that magically did stuff and people didn't really understand that it was that it was actually an art form right there's this whole technical and artistic part of this stuff and and people make these things and people think up these ideas and i i think back in those days it's just it just never occurred to most people that that was really true and and that's why you kind of got those blank stares you know when you would tell people what you did for a living and nowadays you are a well respected pioneer in video games so. uh, I, I hope i'm well respected <laughs> so times changed a lot so so how did it actually happen that you you made the first step stone of point and click graphic adventures were you tired of typing in text commands in adventures that have been there before? Uh, or how did that happen? Yeah, it's actually very much that. You know, Gary and I, Gary Winnick and I, we had, you know, I just finished, a, I'd finish up porting two games from the Atari to the Commodore 64. And I was only a contractor at Lucasfilm. I wasn't actually a full-time employee, but I really wanted to be an employee. And I knew, you know, the way to be, the way to become an employee was to actually get a project going. And so that's when Gary and I started talking about Maniac Mansion, but we didn't really know what kind of game it was. You know, I don't think it had occurred to us during the early stages of that game that it was actually an adventure game. You know, we were doing a lot of just creative stuff. We were, you know, thinking up of these, you know, this weird family that lived there and this house and these kids and all this stuff. But it had never, it had never kind of coalesced in my head that this was actually an adventure game and it wasn't until you know i saw uh, my cousin play king's quest one which i had never played before never even seen it before and i watched him play king's quest one and then it just kind of dawned on me it's like oh well this is exactly what maniac mansion needs to be it needs to be an adventure game and i would played a lot of text adventure games you know, i played you know the infocom games and i'd 
you know, played the text adventure games on the computers back at uh, college and stuff. And I, you know, I, I quite enjoyed them, but I, I don't know that I was a, I was a huge fan of them, right? I wasn't like addicted to playing adventure games, but it just all made sense after seeing King's Quest that Maniac Mansion should be an adventure game. But I did know that I really did not like the whole typing aspect of it. And it's not that I, you know, physically don't like to type. It's, it's the thing that troubled me about it is, you know, in, in games, you know, you would you would walk up to something and you would say, you know, you would type pick up plant and it would say, well, I don't know what a plant is. And you go, well, pick up bush. And it would go, well, I don't know what a bush is. And you go pick up fern and it go, OK, I'll pick up the fern. And that just seemed ridiculous to me because I would spend a whole bunch of time staring at this thing on the screen and wanting to pick it up. And I couldn't because I couldn't think of, you know, one of the synonyms that the game designer had come up with for the thing. And so it just made more sense to me that I should just be able to click on it, right? I should just be able to select this pickup verb and then just touch the thing on the screen. And I think that's really where the whole interface uh, came from, was really that that frustration. Okay, so this is how... How this scam engine went to be by your own frustration, kind of. Yeah, I think a lot of I think a lot of innovations happen through frustration. You know, you're you're frustrated with the way things currently work, so you figure out a different way, you know, a different way to do them. So, did you know at that point that you actually are pioneering in something? No, not at all. We had absolutely no no understanding of that at all. I mean, we were just making a game and. You know, Maniac Mansion didn't actually do that well, you know, when it was first released, right? It, it wasn't a huge hit. And, you know, we did that, and then David did Zach McCracken, and then, you know, Brian had started Loom, and then we did the Indiana Jones game, and then I did Monkey Island. And, you know, so I think there was just, I think it was a very slow kind of evolution, you know, into yeah, that. Yeah, that's actually I, true. Uh, um, I, I, I've seen an interview with David Fox, and he actually said, that Maniac Mansion, Zack McCracken, and all the other games were a lot better in Europe um, than in America. They were doing a lot better in Europe. And that is also the reason why there was a German version, for example, from Maniac Mansion and Zack McCracken, which is something that, that is unique, that wasn't so common in the 80s. Yeah, they they did a lot better. You know what I I don't know the exact sales numbers for Monkey Island. Um, you know, since I left, I knew them before I left, and you know, as of the time that I left Lucasfilm, Monkey Island had sold more copies in Germany than it had in the United States. Right, so just in Germany, it had sold more copies, and so I, I think the Lucasfilm games were always much much more popular in Europe than they ever were. Where you know Sierra was hugely popular in the U.S. You know Sierra would sell five or ten times the number of copies that Lucasfilm did of any of their games. And that was always very frustrating to us, you know, because it's like we looked at, at our games, you know, like, you know, Loom or Zack or Monkey Island or any of those, and we, and, and we think, oh, these are so much better than the Sierra games. Mm -hmm. And yet the Sierra games just sold ten times the number of copies. And that was, you know, that was, that was very frustrating, you know. And, you know, games like Maniac Mansion and you know, Monkey Island and all those games, they weren't like huge hits over here. You know, it's like people often ask me, it's like, well, why did you leave Lucasfilm? You know, you had this amazing hit on your hand, this huge franchise. And I'm like, well, that's that's not exactly the way it was. I think, you know, those games took a while to where they kind of, you know, seeped into this kind of classic um you know, mode that they are that they are right now. They they were not huge hits right out the door. So actually, how did it happen that you decided to make um, localized versions of the game? That would interest me. I mean, later games even were available in Spanish and French. I think the Indiana Jones games were Spanish and French, for example. But you yeah, started the, out with German for some reason. Yeah, yeah the, the localization of, um, you know, of those games, I think, I think that you can really thank the the guy doug glenn he was he did our marketing back at lucasfilm and you know when we were doing the games you know me and david and brian and all these people we didn't really think about the you know localization right that was just not something that entered our heads and <clears throat> doug uh who was the marketing person he had lived in europe for quite a while and so you know he he had kind of said look you know we should we should move these things to europe 
And what a lot of companies were doing back then is is they would you know take their game and they would just kind of license it to one company that just dealt with all of Europe. You know, it's like, well, here's the thing and let them deal with Europe. And, you know, I think the thing that Doug did that was very innovative at the time was, you know, he said, no, we're going to go to each individual country. So we're going to cut deals with Spain, with a publisher in Spain and a publisher in Germany and a publisher in France and a publisher in Italy. And each one of these countries is going to have their own publishers. Because you know he he his thought was if they had their own publishers they would they would pay a lot more attention to their particular market, and he was just a, he was also a big fan of localizing them and getting them localized you know into the languages since we were going to these individual countries. So that's really how that came about. Um, how would you actually start designing a game like Maniac Mansion? Because at the beginning of the interview, you said you didn't actually have enough patience to. To design an RPG. Well, wasn't it originally with Maniac Mansion? Didn't it? Wasn't it like a, a different kind of game? It was like on paper, or it was storyboarded out, or something before you even started with the computer side of it. Yeah, I mean, when I say I didn't have the patience to do an RPG, I, I was also 15 years old, you know, when I was doing that RPG, right? I was, you know, 21 years old when I was doing Maniac Mansion. So I, I think you 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 get a little more professional patience as you get older um but you know like i said you know we didn't really understand you know that maniac mansion was an adventure game initially right and so if you look at our, our very very early design stuff which i think has been you know lost to the ether at this point it really was just about the story right it was just about the characters it really wasn't about what anybody was doing um and it wasn't until you know, i had seen the king's quest thing and thought oh this should be an adventure game The thing Gary and I said, oh, well, okay, so, you know, we have to have a bunch of rooms and we have to have a bunch of objects and we got a bunch of puzzles. And, you know, we we just made this big giant chart. You know, Gary just drew this big chart with little boxes on it for all the rooms. And we, you know, we wrote, you know, oh, well, this is where you find the key and this is where you find the vacuum tube. And, you know, we drew little lines between the vacuum tube and the radio because you need to pick up the vacuum tube and use in the radio. And that was really just kind of how we started doing the design for that game. And I don't, you know, I don't think we we had any idea what we were doing. You know, we we just kind of said, oh, okay, let's make an adventure game and 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 started doing it. So, um, so in the end, you you also did design for Maniac Mansion in a way that you would have like I guess like um, construction kit where well, you okay. could. I, I guess the, the the better question would be, um, yeah, when you were designing Maniac Mansion, and and you built this this um, the system for for programming it. Was it your intention to use that on games down the road, or were, when you designed it, were you planning to just kind of do it with this game? Yeah, I don't think I'd really thought down the road too much. You know, I had started programming Maniac Mansion all in 6502 assembly language, and you know, a few months into that, I, I think I very quickly realized how impossible you know that was to do, and. There was another um, guy working at Lucasfilm named Chip Morningstar, and you know he was the one that said, "Oh, well, you should build a little scripting language, you know, and then you could build the game in this kind of script stuff." And I thought, "Oh, well, that's really interesting." And I never heard of that before. I mean, that's the way Infocom had done their games and Sierra had done their games, and this was all new to me. It's like I'm like, "Ooh, scripting language, that's interesting." So then I went and I did a bunch of research on it, and and that's really you know how Scum came about. But I don't I don't think you know, we didn't have as a company, we, we had no conscious plan, you know, to design this game and then we'll, we'll leverage the technology and build all these other games. It was just kind of this thing that happened. And I think it was mostly because David Fox had been working on Maniac Mansion and then he wanted to go do Zach McCracken. And he was also very familiar with the scum system, obviously, because he had just, you know, got done working on Maniac Mansion. So it just it made more sense for him to, to you know, to do Zach McCracken using the using the scum engine. And, you know, if you look at the scum engine that was used for Maniac Mansion, you know, there was a lot of um, pieces of the scum system that were very specific to Maniac Mansion. Right. I mean, it was not a general purpose scripting system at that point. It was the Maniac Mansion scripting system. And it wasn't until David went and did Zach that I kind of said, all right, I need to really abstract this. I need to pull all these specific things out of the engine 
and turn them into commands that people can use. And I think that's, I think Zach was really the thing that pushed the scum engine to, to be something that could be used on a whole lot of other games. It, it was even used on other games besides Lucasfilm or LucasArts later on. Um, for example, Adventuresoft did uh, Simon the Sorcerer. That was a huge hit in, in, in Germany and Europe. And that's also using the scum engine, right? So you also did like use the no, technology. It's, no, or? it's not. No, it's not. Huh? Um, okay. Yeah, Lucasfilm was the only uh, people that use this use the scum system. When I started Humongous Entertainment, I licensed the scum system uh, to do the games we did at Humongous Entertainment, but that was it. No, no other company used the scum system. So it's kind of um, recoding that stuff kind of a clone what are what other companies are using then yeah yeah i mean I, I think they you know they more kind of looked at you know what we were doing from a ui standpoint and you know they didn't have access to our source code and you know they couldn't have you know decompiled the game and that kind of stuff at that time so i think they were looking they were looking at the stuff more from the outside i mean very similar to the way i looked at king's quest and went oh you know, I didn't I didn't see any of Sierra's code for King's Quest, but I spent enough time, you know, um, you know, really going through and 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 dissecting King's Quest from a from a game design standpoint, and I think that's probably what other people did, you know, with games like Maniac Mansion when they did stuff, is they just looked at them you know, from the outside. Hmm. What would interest me, by the way? Um, it was also ported on many other games, for example, the NES. How did it happen that there was this Famicom Japanese version that totally looked like a manga, kind of, <laughs> by Chaleco? And um, when you read on the internet, it says it's unlicensed. But, when it's, but if it's unlicensed, then I wonder why the same company actually got the contract to make the NES version for Europe and America. Uh, that I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't involved in the contractual parts of, you know, getting Maniac Mansion on the NES. Um, that was all something was kind of done by, you know, the marketing and business people at, at Lucasfilm. Um, you know, Gary and I did a lot of, you know, looking at things and approving things, you know, during the port process. But but the business side of stuff, I, I don't really know how all that happened. Um, I guess except the the censorship of the NAS, you have been involved with that, right? Because that's well, the kind of a story you, you tell a lot of times. Yeah, I mean, we were involved in it in that, you know, we would hear you know, back from Nintendo that, you know, this had to be changed and, you know, this had to be changed and that had to be changed. And, you know, we were involved in it in, in, in the fact that, you know, we kind of heard all the stuff back and, you know, we kind of helped make the decision, you know, with, with the management at Lucasfilm about whether we were going to push back on stuff, right? Because you don't just blindly do everything they say, right? You look at all the stuff and you go, you know what, we'll do these seven things, but we don't want to do these three things. And so, you know, we were involved in, in that process of, you know, creatively deciding, you know, what we were willing to do and, and not willing to do. That must have hurt you in a way as a designer, especially because uh, Lucasfilm game and your games and Gary Winnick games are known for their special kind of humor. Yeah, I don't know if it's painful. I think we found it more amusing than anything else. You know that that for some somehow, you know, Nintendo saw a, a statue as being obscene, right? Just because you know this statue, which you know was was created hundreds of years ago, was somehow you know naked and and you know this was all just like horrible pixel art, either, right? I mean, it's not like you could become you know, er er erotically aroused by looking at this thing. It, but so we, we just we just found it to be more funny that all this stuff, you know, was um, they, they felt had to had to be changed. <laughs> well, I guess it depends on how you look at it. For example, sex games on the C64 was one of the most successful games back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so... So you made you made all those games, and you said you weren't very happy that they didn't do so well in in America. 
But on the other hand, now you made Simpleweed Park, as I understand, which is a successor um, of Maniac Mansion, kind of. I mean, it also plays in 87. Yeah, it's... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a spiritual successor, I guess. I mean, obviously, it's not a sequel, but but it does, you know, it does take a lot of the design things, you know, that we thought about with Maniac Mansion and Monkey Island and really, you know, I mean, I think what we wanted to do with the game was, was, to, was to modernize in a certain way, right? We didn't want to modernize those games we did in, in Thibbleweed Park by, you know, getting rid of the verb UI and getting rid of, you know, everything that, to me, you know, makes adventure games special, right? We didn't want to, we didn't want them to become like the Telltale games, you know, where they were just, you had just modernized every special aspect of adventure games away, you know, except the narrative part. But, you know, we wanted to do stuff where we were being a lot smarter about the puzzle design and we were being a lot smarter about exploration and discovery and all those other things that we, that we just kind of fumbled our way through. You know, things like Maniac Mansion and, and Zack and Monkey Island and and really kind of take a look at it. So it's it's kind of a you know spiritual successor in, in that regard, but it's not really like a historical successor, right? I mean, we do a lot of things with the graphics and lighting and shading and all this stuff in Thimbleweed Park, which you just could not have done back then at all, right? And so, um, you know, we're not trying to be, you know, a, a pure game that could have come out then. You know, it's like, I, I sometimes get mail or, or people on Twitter who are like, oh, well, you know, why don't you port this to the Commodore 64? Or why don't you port <laughs> Thumbleweed Park to the Amiga? And I just go, well, because that would just be impossible. You know, there's just no way that this game would exist on those platforms. I mean, not without the graphics, um, you know, and, and just the pure scope and size of the world, just having to take a massive, massive cut in order for that to happen. So, you know, we've always described Thumbleweed Park it's kind of how you remember those games, right? It's not how those games actually were. It's kind of how you remember them. And the fact, and the fact that people think that we could port it to the Amiga, I, th- I think says we succeeded in that, right? Because, because they remember Monkey Island on the Amiga, and then they look at Thimbleweed Park, and they go, oh, well, this was exactly how Monkey Island looked on the Amiga, so clearly you can port this to the Amiga. And so, so really we were just playing on people's memories of these games more than we were actually recreating these games <laughs> <laughs> and it, it brings up an interesting point which you bring up before about the modernization of of games and how for a while it was every game had to be super every, every aspect of it was was changed and modernized you know uh things like monkey island which had been relatively you know 2d sort of you know um they they knew that they were on a computer and they didn't try to be anything that they that you know anything else um they were in 3d and the and the verb thing was gone and everything had to change with that and and now i feel almost like um with the with the retro craze if they're people are calling it that um (laughs) people are kind of realizing that that it doesn't need to be modern to be a really good game so does that sort of give you like the the freedom to explore that more and kind of go back and pull out the good parts of it that were kind of discarded a few years ago yeah i mean i think i think that's true for me it's like you know i had you know left lucasfilm and was working you know on the children's games at humongous entertainment so i kind of missed this whole phase where people said you know oh all this stupid stuff adventure games let's let's get rid of the verbs let's go to 3d let's you know do all this i kind of missed that phase right and it's it's hard to say what I would have done had I stayed at Lucasfilm, right? I mean, I may have been may have been caught up in exactly the same types of you know interface changes and you know weird changes that happened, but I really wasn't there. So, you know, I, I guess I get to I get to look at this a little bit from the outside, right? I get to look at it with twenty twenty hindsight and go, yeah, okay, well that probably wasn't the best change to make, and that wasn't the best change to make, and you know, for Thibbley Park. You, you know, what I wanted to do is I really wanted to go all the way back, you know, to kind of, you know, 
what I consider the core of classic point and click adventure games, which, you know, is that UI, you know, it is the verb interface. And I wanted to go all the way back to that. Cause I think if I'd gone halfway back to it, if I'd gone back and said, well, I'm going to do, you know, the one click, you know, use verb interface and, you know, the pop-up coin menus and all this other stuff. I don't, I don't know that I could have done that authentically, right? Because I didn't really do a lot of games like that. And so I felt like I needed to go all the way back and, part of it was a little bit of self-discovery. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to go back and I'm going to make one of these things and I'm going to try to make this game so it, you know, appeals to modern gamers, but I still want to use this verb interface. So, you know, what what is it that works about the verb interface and what is it that doesn't work about the verb interface? And and I feel like I can almost only do that by kind of making a game again with the verb interface. And if I was going to do another point and click adventure game um i probably wouldn't do the verb interface you know it's like now that i've kind of done the verb interface i have a lot of ideas now about the way i would want to do an interface so it's not a dumbed down interface because i i find the you know that single use verb right where you click on something and it just does magically does the thing i find that really dumbing down puzzle solving right because you know is you're just doing a lot of clicking on the screen hoping things randomly hoping things happening i think it also encourages the randomly using items with items thing because you know you only have this this one dimension that you can play with now which is what item do i use on this other item because you've lost that second dimension of the verbs and and i think it it makes people do that thing where they're just endlessly dragging things onto the screen to try to get something to work because they don't they don't have an extra axis to play with there <laughs> and you know i've just had some ideas about how i would solve that so I don't think I would do the verb interface um, again if I was going to do another point and click game. <laughs> this um, trying out what you can do. I remember that trying how to kill how to kill um, one of the one of the children that I control in the most craziest way, you know, <laughs> in Maniac Mansion. <laughs> that was one of the things, yeah. <laughs> Or also a classic is the hamster in the microwave when it makes plop. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that was that was very funny. I actually I actually read that was David Fox idea with the hamster and the microwave. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yes, he's he's the sick individual, not me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. Um <laughs> so so after this success with Simpleweed Park, people actually speculate if you would do another adventure game after that. You mean speculate? Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry, speculate, <laughs> right. Wrong word. Yeah, I, d I don't know. I mean, that, that's the good question. You know, it's like, you know, like I said, if I was going to do another point and click game, I would probably not want to use the verb interface. Um, and, you know, doing these games is actually a lot of work. You know, it's, it's a lot of work to do these things. And it actually costs a fair amount of money. You know, I mean, we, we spent around a million dollars to make Thumbleweed Park. And, you know, it's like, it's like, well, that's a lot of money. It's like, you know, I don't have that money. And, you know, I don't think Thumbleweed Park didn't make that much money. And so it's like, well, you know, would we have to go back to Kickstarter to get the game made? Do we really want to do that? And, you know, we've also you know, probably got three or four months of work left on Thimbleweed Park, right? Because there's all the ports, there's iOS, and there's all these other things that we have to do. So none of us are really done with the game yet, and we probably won't be done, you know, for another three or four months. So it's not like we ship Thimbleweed Park and we can just immediately go start working on another game. So you're keeping it like in the past. You don't want to give it to a constructor to do, uh, to a contractor to do all the ports. You want to do it with your own team kind of to make sure that the experience on the Xbox or um, other systems is the same that you would have on a PC or a Mac? It, it depends. You know, some of the ports we are giving out to port houses to do because they're they're very straightforward ports and but other ports we're actually doing ourselves just because they're interesting interface issues or they're interesting controller issues and we want to be able to explore like all the the mobile ports like ios and android i'm doing all those myself because i really want to you know make sure that the 
the touch controls kind of work and that they feel right. And I mean, we're still going to have the verb interface, right? We're not, we're not doing some weird wacky, you know, pinch to zoom type control on the, on the thing. It still is the authentic controls, but it still has to feel good, right? There's still little subtle changes you make to things. And like, like right now in, in the engine, when you press the mouse button, right, the, the system recognizes the mouse press when the mouse button goes down, right? Um, on, on when you're dealing with touch platforms, you have to recognize the mouse when you when your finger comes off of the screen, not when your finger goes on the screen, because there's just it, because there's lots of things you want to do. Like you want to be able to scan around the room and see what things are. So you need to be able to touch your finger on and then move your finger around mm -hmm. and not have it actually engage anything until your finger comes off the screen, right? It seems like a very subtle little thing, but it is the kind of stuff that that makes you know, makes a touch interface seem natural. And so things like that, I want to play with myself, you know, to, to figure those out. Yeah. The, the touch aspect can be a, the, I, I've never really, I, I'm almost consistently disappointed with game ports on, on iOS or, or even Android, just because it's, you're used to using a mouse or a joystick and it's a totally different kind of thing. Although with Android, you can plug a mouse into the phone. So, Right. Yeah, you can actually plug a mouse into the Xbox. I didn't oh. know that, but apparently you can. Huh. Um, but anyway, so I was, um, you know, I, I totally agree with you. And I, and I think that's especially true for games that are ported that use controllers. Because, you know, doing a controller interface on a touchscreen, I mean, I hate those little virtual controllers that pop up. I mean, they, they, they never, never work. Yeah. You know, mouse is a little easy. You know, I think point and click adventures work kind of easy because you're really you're pointing to stuff, right? You're just you're touching things on the screen, and I just want that to feel. I want that to feel very natural to people, yet still feel you know like you know the verb interface and and feel like the game. I don't want to scrap the whole interface and come up with this completely different model for everything. So <laughs> that that just takes some time to figure out. Hmm. You mentioned earlier that it's a lot of time to actually and work to actually design a point-and-click adventure game. So, so how how much time did you actually need for a room or a scene on Maniac Mansion or Thimbleweed Park? What are the figures um, that the gamer doesn't know um, that you put in as a work? Well, you know, we we go through and we design like with Thimbleweed Park. You know, we probably spent maybe three or four months just doing design work. Now, I was doing engine work, you know, trying to get the engine up and running. But a lot of it is just design work. You know, we're designing this stuff out and, you know, we're doing, you know, quick sketches of the room so we kind of understand what they look like and, and, and things like that. So that's probably like a four-month process. That's just a lot of design. Um, and then, you know, it probably takes – you know, Mark Ferrari did all the backgrounds or most of the backgrounds in the game. And it would probably take him maybe three or four days to do a background screen. And it would probably take us probably two days to do the programming to get a room up and running. But that was like the initial programming. It's like you never stop, right? There's all these pieces that flow together. And, you know, even though it only took you a couple of days to get the room, you know, programmed and functional, you just, you know, you spend a lot of time over the course of the next year and a half just constantly working on that room and, you know, spending a couple hours a day on it or even a couple of minutes, you know, just, oh, I got to change this thing and, ch and change and change that thing. Um, you know, so the art is something that kind of happens as as this one event. You know, the artist goes off and draws the room and then boom, the room's in the game. And it may need a couple of adjustments and changes, but but from an art standpoint, you know, they're, they're essentially done where the programming is much more of an evolution that happens. You know, there's this peak event when it goes in and then you're just, you're just constantly tweaking and changing it. Well, that must be very tiring at a point. It is, you know, you spend two years working on the same game and you know, you're, you're very tired of it. Like, I don't think I've worked on any game that I wasn't sick of by the time the game shipped. You know, I, I hated Monkey Island when that game shipped. I never, ever wanted to see it again. And, you know, every other game has been the same way. It's like, you, you just, you're tired of it, right? And then a couple of months goes by and then 
you know, you're rested and you had some vacation, then you can kind of look back on it and go, oh, okay, this is a pretty good game. I guess I didn't totally screw this up. <laughs> That's very honest of you. That's very honest. <clears throat> so, so if it's such, this is such a pain to actually make an adventure game, how come you always went back to it and made another one? Well, I don't think adventure games are any more complicated than anything, right? I mean, no matter what I wanted to do, I think you've got a lot of complication. It's like I really enjoy designing adventure games. I don't think I enjoy playing them, you know, nearly as much as I enjoy designing them. You know, if if I'm going to go play a game, I enjoy things like RPGs. You know, I don't I don't really like um, you know adventure games. I play a lot of adventure games for professional reasons, just so I can you know, understand what the competition is doing and, and see stuff like that. But it's it's very rare that I'll just for pure enjoyment sit down with an adventure game. You know, it's usually um usually like RPGs, you know, Western style RPGs, you know, like Diablo and stuff. I d I don't really get into the, like the Japanese RPGs, but I but I really enjoy I enjoy walking around and, and beating on things with a sword. I guess that's what I really enjoy. <laughs> nice, nice. So so you you are a gamer by heart yourself, so that of course means it makes easier to to make a game that other people would enjoy, because you know what you enjoy yourself the most. Yeah, I think I think that helps. I mean, I think it would be really hard to be you know a writer or a filmmaker if you hated movies and hated books. You know, I think that would be very hard to do. So I, I think to be successful in any creative medium, I think you have to enjoy the medium, right? I think because you have to understand the nuances of the medium and you have to understand, you know, what what subtle things work and, and don't work. And I think there are times when, you know, people may move into a new medium and not really understand it that I think can be actually beneficial. Like I, I do think one of the things that made Maniac Mansion so interesting was that Gary and I had no idea what we were doing. You know, we we hadn't done a bunch of games, we hadn't studied adventure game design, we didn't know what all the rules were. So, you know, when we started doing that game, we just b broke a lot of the rules because we had no idea that they were actually rules that we were supposed to follow. And and I think that can that can be a good thing to do. But I think generally, I think you you do need to kind of, you know, love and understand the medium that you're working in. I wonder, by the way, what's your opinion about all those fan projects that do a new Maniac Mansion or what if somebody would try to make the Japanese Famicom version into English? Because I know a lot of designers and companies, they hate fame, fan projects and mm -hmm. even try to stop them. What's your personal opinion um, about those projects? Well, I think there's two aspects of that, right? There's, you know, there whether you enjoy that stuff. Like a lot of people have been doing fan art for Thimbleweed Park, right? And I love to see it, right? And, you know, some people have been doing their fan art for Thimbleweed Park and putting it on T-shirts and selling it, right? And it's like, I mean, generally, I don't have a problem with that. But there's a, there's kind of this legal issue that you have to protect your trademarks, right? If If you let people put Thimbleweed Park on stuff and you don't do anything to stop them, you will lose your trademark, Because it is something that the law says that you have to defend. And so, you know, I kind of feel like a jerk sometimes because I, you know, I go to people and I go, ah, you, you really can't sell that Thimbleweed Park t-shirt. You know, I need you to stop doing that. And I feel like a jerk, right? Because it's like, personally, I kind of like that. I mean, I love that they're doing that. I don't mind seeing it all. But we do have to make sure that we protect our trademark on stuff. And so there, you know, there are just, there are little things like that that, that there's there's kind of what you you personally you know like and would allow and then there's what you can legally allow people to do and that's always kind of a line that you have to follow what about hmm. um um resurrections of old things because i know um i don't know how much you had to do with habitat when that was made years and years ago but there's a revival um i think there might be two different versions um because there is the the q link reloaded for the c64 and mm -hmm. uh, um, I think Randy Farmer, who was one of the guys that, that 
designed habit that or created it uh, is leading right. like a, a bringing it back on the original hardware mm-hmm. and everything. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that I think that stuff is really good because I think I think video games have this problem of being lost to history because our technology changes so rapidly. Right. And you think about you even think about, you know, film you know, a hundred years ago, we can still watch those movies. I mean, not a whole lot has to happen for me to watch, you know, a a hundred year, 75 year old film. So it's, you know, it's like, you know, for us to be able to read books that were, you know, printed 500 years ago or to watch movies that were made a hundred years ago, there's very little kind of technology that has to happen. But to play games that were made even 10 years ago is actually incredibly difficult for us to do. Um, you know, luckily computers keep getting better and better and you can write emulators and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But but I think there needs to be this real conscious effort in games to preserve those games, to make sure that those things, you know, are are playable on, on modern hardware. So, you know, taking something like Habitat and, you know, getting it playable again. I mean, I don't, I don't think that, you know, suddenly Habitat's going to become the next World of Warcraft, you know, when it goes live. (laughs) But I think there are a lot of historical things about Habitat that are really, really useful for for people to understand. You know, I didn't work directly on Habitat. There was a lot of technology sharing between Maniac Mansion and Habitat Mm -hmm. when it was being built. And, you know, obviously I knew Chip and Randy really well. And, you know, we talked about stuff. And, you know, I remember, you know, uh, playing World of Warcraft, which I played a whole lot of. And, just a lot of the issues that, you know, Blizzard was dealing with with World of Warcraft. I mean, simple things like griefing and stuff were all things that Chip and Randy had to deal with back in Habitat. Mm-hmm. You know, they they dealt with almost every single core issue that a modern MMO deals with today. It's like they dealt with all of those issues. And I think it's it's really important for for people to understand that and, and to, you know, maybe go experience Habitat and understand you know, how they had to had to solve those problems and, you know, what they came up with for the solutions to those problems. Mm-hmm. So so I think from an historical standpoint, I think it's really, really important to preserve, preserve games. And preserve the fact that I've been lost in the sewers in there for about 30 years now. <laughs> <laughs> because the system doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yes. Yes, you are right. That's one thing you have mentioned, Ron. A lot of effort is now taking place in preserving, actually, video games and arcades. And actually, it's sad to know that some games are even lost forever. For example, arcade games where there would be batteries that leak out on the ships mm-hmm. right. that nobody mm-hmm. has the data of anymore. So, so some games are unfortunately lost, even though... So even though we have emulation, since the source data is no more there, um, well, that's an issue. Um, but when it comes to adventure games, for example, Scum, there's even its own emulator, Scum yeah. VM, I think it's called. Mm-hmm. Yep, Scum VM. So, so is that something you, you appreciate that is existing? Yeah, I, I appreciate it quite a bit. You know, when I whenever I want to play you know, Maniac Mansion or Monkey Island or any of these games, I do it all under Scum VM. You know, I don't, I don't go, you know, dust off my floppy disk drives and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I just, I just boot up Scum VM, right? Because I know it works on, you know, all modern hardware and that's, that's certainly how I do it. And so I, I mean, I do really appreciate that project quite a bit. And I think, you know, we need more things like that to help preserve these games. Were you involved at all with the remasters of, of Monkey Island 1 and 2? No. No, they did that all after I left. Oh. I, di- I didn't even know they were doing it, you know, until like maybe two months before they released them. Mm. You know, they told me they were doing them. So, yeah, I had, I had nothing to do with those. Hmm. So, basically, you don't have any well, trademarks left on Maniac Mansion. So, uh, Timbleweed Park is like a restart for you. In uh, in traffic adventures, yeah, in, in that sense, right? I mean, I don't own Maniac Mansion or Monkey Island, and um, you know, those are all owned by Disney now. But you know, at least Thimbleweed Park, you know, we do own that, right? So we can, you know, kind of do what we want, um, what we want with it. Hmm. 
interesting. And um, now, now you said you, before you made um, education software for kids. Freddie Fish. Yes. Yeah, I don't think it was really educational software. <laughs> you know, it's like when we when we did that. You know, we we were very careful to never call it educational software. It's like these were games for kids, right? They were we always envision them as like really nice bedtime stories for kids, right? When you, when you read your kid a bedtime story, you know, it's, it's not an educational book, right? You're not, you're not running multiplication tables with your kid while you're putting them to bed. You're just reading them a really nice story. That's got really interesting little morals to it. And it's a little story that your kids can maybe learn something from before they go to sleep. And that's, that's how we always thought about the adventure games that we did at humongous entertainment. They were just really nice, charming bedtime stories. I'll I'll and attest uh, to the yeah. the no, the goodness because I had no idea that that you had anything to do with with uh, those games uh, at the time, and I had a, a a CD-ROM of one of the Freddy Fish games came with an older Mac that I had, and and I just I opened it up just to see what it was, and I'm looking at it, and then an hour later I'm still playing it, and I'm like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, yeah, they, they they were they're entertaining, even if you're not even if you're not a kid. <laughs> yeah, I you know I think they're really good adventure games. You know, I'm just incredibly proud of those games, and you know all of the lessons that I learned, you know, with Maniac Mansion and Monkey Island, and all those lessons just poured right into those games. You know, all the lessons about adventure game design and puzzle design, and you know, interactive narrative, and all those things. So. You know, I'm in, I'm incredibly proud of this. Excuse me, proud of those games. You know, I don't. Um, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily associate them with me. You know, you talk about you know games that Ron Gilbert did, and most people don't pull up Putt Putt and Pajama Sam and Freddy Fish as those games. You know, they're always Monkey Island and stuff. But I just cannot tell you the number of people that I run into who played those games. You know, millions of kids played those games, you know, and they, they didn't really even understand, you know, that they were playing adventure games at the time. And they were just these really, really fun games that they played. And, you know, I, I think that that to me is is really, really neat. Well, we always try to get the whole picture of somebody we interview. That is why we bring it up. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, Plus, you know, these games are so, you know, even almost every game really that you can that you can point to that has been that you've had a hand in has been hugely influential in a lot of things you know maniac mansion was was the beginning of this whole kind of genre of of games almost i mean it was a tv show for god's sake um <laughs> a really bad tv show i wasn't, never I wasn't gonna that. say <laughs> that part but yeah <laughs> yeah and but, now we know what you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> we have it on recording. <laughs> but I mean, there, but even other things, you know, Monkey Island. There's, there's, um, there's a reference to it in some. Oh, I can't think of what the game is. It's, it's a modern game, a modern kind of RPG adventure game. And there's like an there's, island that was founded by part by pirates, and his picture is on the wall, Guybrush. Right. And I can't think of what I, you probably know what it is. I think but, it's Uncharted. Yes, Uncharted. That's right. I mean, this stuff is all all through here. In fact, you invented the term cutscene, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, for Maniac Mansion. Yeah. I mean, we didn't we didn't invent cutscenes, right? I mean, there were games before Maniac Mansion that had you know had little non interactive scenes that happened, but coining the word cutscene, you know, that was that was definitely you know something that came from Maniac Mansion. Yeah. Um, and I, and I I really have no idea how that how that word gained that popularity I and mean, i think we used it on the back of the box i think we you know we used the word cutscene on the back of the box but it was nothing we set out to promote right we just we used that word and then internally we you know we always referred to them as cutscenes, and we called them cutscenes. and and i have no idea how it became this industry standard you know word for that kind of stuff and i mean it's even used like outside the industry you know like i i remember i don't know if they still do but you know variety the you know the hollywood you know movie you know newspaper it's like they have a little column about video games and it's called cutscene that's the name of the column right and so i don't i don't know how that all the how that all happened well, <laughs> well that must feel 
um, fill you with a lot of proudness to have so much influence in in a thing, you know, in video games, and as I said, even in genres as uh, movies. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, it's it's really kind of interesting. It is it is definitely satisfying, you know, to, to think about that kind of stuff, to think of, and not just me, but, you know, a lot of the people at Lucasfilm, I think, had this huge influence on influence on stuff um you know that that we did what is, what are your actually plans after Thimbleweed park about the future did you already think about that yeah i don't really know you know like i said we've you know probably got three or four months of work you know that i'm going to be really busy on and i don't really know kind of what's after that maybe i'll finally build that rpg that i started when i was 15 <laughs> Do we still have the source code and all the <laughs> <laughs> notes from no, that? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I mean, that was all written in Z80 assembly language, so I don't. I don't. I don't know that it really would have survived the years. <laughs> oh yeah, Z80. That was even the processor even used by the Game Boy once. Mm. <clears throat> I think it was. Oh, yeah, it was. yeah, it was. Great. So um, you, you mentioned you will spend a few months on on completing that game. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that boxed version that I pledged for the Kickstarter. Yeah, a lot of people are. We've we've just started designing that. We we kind of decided, you know, let's not worry about the box until we ship the game, just because we have so much to do. But we've we've started designing uh, designing that box now, and that's really fun because. We really want to make it an authentic Lucasfilm box, right? It should it should feel like one of those boxes, right? And it shouldn't be like crappy cardboard and thin cardboard. It's like I want it to be the nice meaty thick cardboard that we used at the Lucasfilm stuff and have all the cool things in the boxes and all those things. So that I think that'll be fun to put together. It'll probably take a while. I imagine we probably won't be done with that box for probably at least six months you know if not longer but but it should it should be a lot of fun but nowadays you can use uh, words like last on it yeah, you know? yeah that's right <laughs> without right. censorship <laughs> <laughs> well, we played or, the game thinking... we 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 yeah. uh we actually sat down and we did a, a small playthrough of it and it was i mean it was, it's it's really well done i'm i'm genuinely super impressed and and I'm not. I'm not a huge gamer. Uh, I, I get some crap for that sometimes because, you know, because a lot of times I'll, I'll be talking about stuff and I. It's obvious that I have no idea what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> but, but these, you know, Monkey Island and and um, and some of the other ones from 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 LucasArts, I have actually played through in their entirety. Even Loom, I've played. And so you know, this stuff I'm, I'm actually aware of and. I got into it, and I'm still playing it. You know, the, the new yeah, I, I I think you know a lot of people, you know, who play Thimbleweed Park. It's like it's like you know they I kind of break them down into these two groups of people, right? There's these people who, you know, used to play graphic adventures, you know, back when they were kids or they were young adults or whatever, and you know they play Thimbleweed Park, and it is kind of like this like rush of nostalgia for them, because. You know, it does. It does really feel like those old games, and they totally get into it. And maybe they haven't played one in quite a while. You know, they haven't really played adventure games, and you know, I think that's, you know, I, I think that's really cool. And then there's this other group of people, which I find far more interesting, which is the people who have never played a graphic adventure before. <laughs> and you know, they they didn't play Monkey Island, they didn't play Maniac Mansion, they didn't play you know any of this stuff, and they kind of pick up the game. You know, either they kind of you know read about it on Twitter, or they you know heard about it through a friend or something, and they play it. And you know, I find it interesting, you know, how fascinated they become with it. You know that it, that it is a game that is just not like anything they've experienced before. And I've seen this with like kids. You know, you get like you know these these you know fourteen and fifteen year old kids who play Thimbleweed Park, and their first kind of reaction is ooh. Whoa, the graphics are ooh, kind of crude. And, and then like three hours later, they're still solving puzzles and then they're playing it because there's something that really starts to engage their brain in a, in a really interesting way. And I mean, kind of the, that's the group of people that I'm most fascinated with, you know, and, and I wish I had a better way to reach them. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a very, it's from a marketing standpoint, 
I think that's been the hardest thing for us with Thimbleweed Park is to say, well, how do we reach these people? Because I think there's a lot of people out there who would really enjoy you know, a narrative game that also had this puzzle solving aspect to it where your brain really started to kick into gear. But trying to reach them has been has been incredibly difficult to do. Yeah, I mean I mean you saw it yourself at Gamescom two years ago. The retro area is where the parents go with their little kids, like this is how I used to play thirty years ago, and then kids are like, Ooh, old computers, you know? <laughs> right, and right. then they played for for a couple of rounds and like, wow my god, those games are really very cool. Oh, may I play again, Dad, you know? <laughs> so, well, that goes yeah, back it's, to it's, it's, it's it's a hard thing to get over, right? And and I think I think the analogy in movies is like black and white movies. It's like you know who the hell wants to go see a black and white movie today? I think you come out with a black and white movie and everybody goes, oh, black and white movie, not interested in seeing that. But you know they can be just as entertaining. And I think it's this hump you have to get people over. You have to get them beyond the the notion that this is a black and white movie or beyond the notion that this is an eight bit pixel game. And get them to understand that there's actually a really good story or a really good game, you know, be behind all this. Wasn't Sin City like that? I think a part of Sin City was black and white. I think all of it was black. Yeah, and it was white. well, it was black and white, but it had a lot of um, spot color. Mm. It's like you know, splats of blood and stuff would be red, and there were, you know, so they were they were definitely doing the black and white, but they're doing it very artistically, you know. And then there were, I mean, there was a movie, The Artist, that came out what maybe five years ago or so, and I mean that was a black and white silent movie, yeah. right? I mean that's like two hurdles to get over, but you know it won the Academy Award, right? Mm-hmm. I mean it got Best Picture, right? So I think you can. I think you can kind of push beyond that, but I think you have to be really good, right? You can't just be a good black and white movie. You have to be an amazing black and white movie, you know, to kind of push over that. And I think that is, you know, is also true with the games. And, you know, you see some games, right? You see things like, you know, Stuart Valley, for example, which is, you know, an 8-bit, you know, uh, retro-ish game, but that sold millions of copies on Steam. Yeah. You know, and, and I think it's just that, well, that was just an incredibly good game. And for some reason, it just it really grabbed people and was able to, you know, push beyond, um, you know, beyond that barrier. Hmm. And that's what you're trying to reach with Thimbleweed Park, because it's not just an adventure. It's a very good adventure. Good <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a great adventure. It's a great adventure. It's not just good. Yes. <laughs> so so I will look forward to see what what prizes you are going to win with it this year. Yeah, it's going to be hard, you know. It's like I uh, you know, I think our goal with it was to kind of, you know, break through that a little bit and I don't think we've really done that. You know, we've done that in just in in some very small areas, but I don't think we've really succeeded in in you know, breaking beyond kind of the 8-bit retro game. And that's I mean, it's a little bit it's a little bit frustrating. It's like, I think every single review that we got for the game, you know, even though they love the game and we got amazing review scores, they all start the game, start the review out with, you know, Thimbleweed Park is a throwback adventure. And that's like, I always hated that when they'd start out like that. I go, okay, well, you've already pigeonholed the game. It's like in your opening sentence, you have, you have basically told people you, you have stuck the game inside of a little peg. And that's, you know that's that's a little bit disappointing, um, but I you know I think the game has really good word of mouth, and I think that's one of the things that you know it may not be the type of game that you know sells a million copies in the first six months, but I think it's a kind of game that will probably have really really long legs. Mm-hmm. You know I think it's a kind of game that will be selling you know three years from now will actually be selling you know it, it's a small amount but this amazing tail on it. That's kind of what what I figure at this point. Right. Well, plus it's the kind of gameplay that is, and and it, go, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before, where people are realizing that gameplay does not equate necessarily with the newest and hottest technology and and everything else. So, and a lot of games have this sort of, you know, that that the the pixely eight bit kind of graphics style has come back to a lot of games, and I think that this. These games, these are the adventure games, the point and click adventures, have already stood the test of time, and so this one, you know, looking at it on its merits alone and not not trying to define it as a retro style game, I mean, the thing is is 
a, pl- a good playable, you know, it, it's it's a it's a great game that that isn't gonna it's not gonna look outdated in five years because the graphics are the style that it's going for. If right. that makes any yeah, I mean, sense. It's, yeah, it's I mean it's not going to look outdated in 20 years, right. right? It's it's almost it's it's, it's timeless because right. of its because of kind of the way that it was the way that it was constructed, right? I mean, in some ways it's outdated today. So it's not going to be any more outdated, you know, in 20 years. Right. Well, I mean, that's that's the thing. Of course, you always have to convince the media and saying but I think when we did our let's play, we didn't put it in a box and say, okay, it's an it's an old stylish game. Um, but then you also have to put into consideration that, as H H just said, a lot of games go with that pixelation look. Back in the day, 30 years ago, it wasn't so pixelated on CRT screens. You know, you had the blur, and you wouldn't see all the pixels. And that is what yeah. a lot of people nowadays don't understand. That graphics thirty years ago weren't so bad. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, they they um, were bad. I mean, it was I'm, just that the 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 viewing technology that we had to see them were equally bad. So it, yeah, I mean, te- te- television back then was analog, right? Yeah. So you were filtering this digital stuff through this analog signal, which was just kind of you know blurring it all up a little bit. And I guess that was okay. It's like you know. Uh, Somebody wrote wrote a little shader filter for Thimbleweed Park that actually puts it through a shader that adds that kind of CRT blur to everything. And you kind of look at it and you're like, yeah, okay, that is the way it looked, but it just doesn't look as good though. It's like you it's like you want to see those sharper pixels, I think, today. I think we're just we're just used to a certain level of clarity in everything that we see. Hmm. And I think when the pixels get blurred up for no apparent reason on your, you know, super high def HD monitor, I think you go, "Ooh, what's wrong?" <laughs> so anyway, if if I had two questions to, uh, sorry, if I had two wishes, I'm I may say to Ron Gilbert, then it would be make 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 a CRT filter in a way, you know. <laughs> I'm I, I'm a fan of that. I'm a fan of that. I'm sorry. I'm a fan just, of that. Just plug your computer into a CRT. That's all. Yeah, there was some, <laughs> somebody adapters. posted a somebody posted a picture on Twitter of them playing Thimbleweed Park on a CRT monitor. <laughs> They'd actually, you know, d- done the whole, you know, a- HDMI conversion to, you know, the 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 composite video and plugged it into a monitor. And, uh, and I, yeah, I think that's really cool. Anyway, that would be and and the second thing. That I really miss in a way. I always said that um, also a couple of times is a music, you know, kind of retro music. Mm. But I know, I know you wrote, I you wrote in a diary on mm. Kickstarter back in the day. You don't want buyers' ears to bleed. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, you know, I love you kind of retro eight bit graphics i just love them right i just i despise i despise that kind of 8-bit music i just hate it (laughs) sorry (laughs) no problem (laughs) yeah i mean i mean there are other examples where where it played out well for example when outrun was re-released in 2006 outrun coast to coast they even made a mode where you can uh, um pick the old music from the arcades mm-hmm. from from 86 I, th- so I think in some I'm... in some applications old music you know the 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 when when it's all you had to work with the music was was pretty good for what it was but now you've got you've got voice acting in the mix you've got got all, so the, the music doesn't become quite the centerpiece that it was back then you know you don't need the music to pretty much fill the scene because people are talking and there's other stuff going on. Whereas in the past, well, also, all you had was music. I also think the music, you know, at least for me as a designer, right? Music is a, a very efficient way to communicate emotion. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 8-bit, true old 8-bit music, it's very, very hard to convey that same emotion. Where if you're dealing with more modern music, um, you can kind of use that to make to to make people feel uneasy, you know, just in how you do the music, or to make them feel a little bit happier, or to make them feel scared, or to make them feel afraid of something. Music is just 
it's just, it's just it's an amazing um it's an amazing way to make an audience feel emotion and to be able to lose that tool in my toolbox mm. um i think would be very difficult for me to do yeah <laughs> okay now we know the reasons <laughs> okay yeah i know i'm i'm a sit ship lover i'm i'm that kind of guy i like the old <laughs> music yeah and it really feels uh, it really fills my heart that i can that I can listen to retro music on an app on my iPhone. That's really the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry for that comment, but it's just me. Anyway, anyway, the game is really great. It it really threw me back to my childhood, you know. And um, I wish there were more games like Simple Beat Park way earlier. Yeah, that that, that was my, my main feeling about it. You know, when we were talking about not. Not looking at it as a retro game, it was when I played it. It was like, okay, a game like I used to play. It's about damn time, you know. It's it's more like this should have been these should have been happening this entire time. But it's like it took a break while people realized, you know, what makes a game good again. Well, I, th I think there's some other aspects to it too. Like I think there's there's a, I mean, I think that th things like Steam have really made this possible, right? Because if we still sold games, you know, in stores on CDs and boxes, and that was the primary way, you would never see anything like Thimbleweed Park, right? You'd never see anything like Stewart Valley. You'd never see any of this stuff. And it's it's having this digital distribution, this almost frictionless free digital distribution, right? I mean, it, it, it took me a day to get my game up on Steam. That's it. You know, it's like just not a lot of work to be able to do that. And I think that's really helped um, – be be able to make these kind of niche markets really feasible, right? Because, you know, point and click adventures, you know, as much as, you know, I and you would love to think they're not, they, they actually are niche markets, but they're actually really big niche markets, right? There's a lot of people that want to play these things and being able to, to distribute and sell to these people is, is really kind of what makes that possible. And so I think you're seeing a lot of things kind of come together at the same time that are making, um, you know, games, you know, nostalgia based games or nostalgia based, you know, genres of games become popular again. I think it's because of all of these factors are kind of hitting at the same time. So this sounds like you were kind of waiting for the right moment to do your symbol beat part. <laughs> Well, I don't think it was a conscious decision. It's not like I've been sitting here every year going, "Oh, is now the time?" No, no, any, next year. Any day now. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think. I don't think it was really that. I. I think there's just you know there's a part of. I mean, I think some of the desire to do Thimbleweed, you know, came from doing the cave, right? And you know, if you play the cave, it's definitely an adventure game, right? But it's a very different controller paradigm it's a you know very different design had to go into that game as an adventure game and i think part of that part of that process just really made me yearn for the ability to do a true point and click game you know without all those strange constraints but to really kind of go back to that stuff and i think that's i think that's really what what drove which drove that mm. And thanks to Kickstarter, you had the tool to actually make it happen. Yeah, I mean, the, the Thimbleweed Park would not have been possible without Kickstarter. I mean, no, no publisher would have funded this game at all. And, you know, and I think that's one of the things that Kickstarter is really good at, right? Kickstarter is really good um, at doing kind of nostalgia-based stuff. You know, where people are like, oh, I remember these. I, I want to pay money for this kind of stuff. I, I think the thing that Kickstarter isn't as good at is doing completely new things hmm. that, that don't have that kind of nostalgia play uh, as a part of them, at least in games. I mean, I, I think that's not true for um, other types of Kickstarter projects. But I think for video games, I, I think that's very true with Kickstarter. It's not like in the seventies or eighties where you would where you would look at the box and say, "Oh, David Crane was the designer. That game must be good, so we will <laughs> we will publish it." It's not like yeah, that anymore, right? Well, yeah. You I mean you don't? I, I think the thing the thing that that you have right now is that you don't have 
individuals that have name recognition as much as you do studios mm. that have name recognition you know naughty dog comes out with a game and you go oh it's a new naughty dog game i guess I'm, I'm sure i'll probably like that and so you've you've kind of have you know the studios have become the celebrities rather than the individual you know people isn't that kind of backwards trending because i mean that is actually how activision was started because the Atari guys were fed up that they weren't mentioned in the games as the designers and started out their own company. That was Activision. So isn't it kind of sad that this recognition goes uh, fades again? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's probably just a cycle. You know, that stuff where, you know, recognition, whether it's studio based or publisher based or, you know, person based, it's just, it's probably just a big cycle that moves back and forth between, you know, between that stuff. I mean, I think there's pluses and minuses to, you know, having people, you know, individually recognized for things, you know, it can be really good branding, but you know, there's also, there's a lot of people that worked on a game, right? It's a, a single person did not work on a game. It was probably much more likely back in the eighties that a single person actually did a game, mm. but that's not really true. Um, but you know, movies, a lot, a lot of times, you know, the, you know, obviously the stars and the director, you know, will get a whole lot of the recognition for that stuff. And I think for most movies, you have no idea who the director was, right? Yeah. You just no idea, nor do you care, right? Unless it's Steven Spielberg or Martin Scorsese or, you know, um, you know, Christopher Nolan or something. There's kind of this group of directors that have become brands unto themselves um, and are kind of worth promoting. And I think that's, you know, that's probably true in the game business too, right? There's, there's a small group of individuals who, who are brands about things, but otherwise it's, it's probably more of the development studios that, that really get the branding for games. Well, you already made your friend. You already made your yeah, name. You could, so. you could just walk into the publisher and be like, I'm Ron Gilbert fool. Yeah. See, that's not actually true. <laughs> <laughs> see, the, the thing is, the thing is, you know, when you're dealing with publishers, the thing is about name recognition, right? And it's like my name. It's like my name will get me a meeting with any publisher, but it will not get me a game deal, mm. right? And so so it's like, you know, there's there's one barrier that's kind of removed for me or anybody, you know, that has, has a name in the business, right? The barrier that is instantly removed is getting a meeting with them, right? I, I can have any meeting with any publisher in the world anytime I want to have it. But that doesn't mean I'm going to actually get a game published by them, right? That process becomes the same for me as an unknown person. As you might have a little bit of an edge because they figure, oh, maybe there's a little bit of a marketing advantage here to kind of offset the risk. But they're still going to be evaluating it purely based on the risk of, of being able to put up the money. And and, and again, that's, that's where Kickstarter works really well because, yeah. you know, something like Thimbleweed Park, was really funded almost entirely on the brand recognition of, you know, Gary and myself, mm -hmm. because that really is the only thing that you kind of have. And Kickstarter works well, you know, in the, in those situations. Yeah. Well, people trust your quality. It's just like in the seventies, eighties, you would look at, Oh, who did the music? Oh, that must be a good game, you know? And, and then you buy the game and the game is crap, but the music is great. So you play the <laughs> game just for the music. Just for the music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Well, old old stories from my childhood. Well, that is the way it used to be, you know. Um, but but you mentioned that you you get a meeting with the publisher and then you have all those deals and so on. That's actually the reason um, David Crane told me in an interview I did with him. That is the reason why he accepted the the video game design business because he was fed up with having to defend himself why he wants to make this and that kind of game and um, isn't that something that you would be fed up to in a way in the future that you say okay I have enough of all this fighting yeah but I, th I think that's just the reality right of that right unless you're independently wealthy and you can just fund fund the thing yourself out of your own pocket so you, are not think... you are not a millionaire yet I, I'm not independently wealthy, right? It's like I, I still have to worry about paying my rent. So, oh, okay. you know, so it's like when you, when, you know, whether you're going to Kickstarter or you're going to a publisher, you have to defend your thing, right? But if I was going to even do a new Kickstarter today, 
based on the success of Thimbleweed Park, I couldn't just put a, put up a Kickstarter page that said, hey, I want to do another adventure game, right? Please give me money, right? I would have to tell people what the story was and I have to put up screenshots and videos and all this stuff. So, you know, I'm still having to to defend what I want to make to a bunch of backers, which, I mean, it's a very different kind of defense than you would do if, if you're pitching to a publisher, but you still have to go through that that whole process. And I don't think there's any way around that unless you're using your own money to, to build something. All right. And back in the 80s, when you were working for Lucasfilm and so on, that was a bit different because we were hired to make a game, so you didn't have to defend your game and reach out to publishers you already had your your instant money flow from your employer yeah it's true but we still had to defend our game right i mean the at lucasfilm we didn't have a, a rigorous green light process right we didn't have to put together presentations and take them to management or anybody but but what we did have to do was we had to defend our game to the other members of the group Right. The way the way games became greenlit um, was just that there was enough excitement. Enough people said, hey, this is a really cool idea. We really like this. And, you know, things like Monkey Island and Maniac Mansion and and, the, you know, the, the, the 10 other games that I designed at Lucasfilm that nobody has ever seen before was this process of writing up these designs and going around and talking to all the people and having them tell me, oh, this is a really shit idea, Ron. This is really <laughs> dumb. We don't like this. And then I crumple up the paper and I throw it in the waste paper basket, right? So it's like, I still went through all that. It's just nobody saw it because it wasn't it wasn't public, but we still had to defend our games. It was more of, of a peer defense of our games rather than this kind of, you know, publisher developer uh, model. Okay. Mm. Yeah, because there's obviously a story that there was those golden ages of developers and then it was easy because everybody <laughs> loved video games. So that's not true. It's that is not true. At kind all. Of, I don't think I don't think it has ever been easy. You know, it's like you're you're constantly having to defend what it is that you're making and you know, having to justify it and having to convince people that this thing is worth spending money on. I think I think I think that has always been the case. And I think the only time that is not the case is if you can completely fund the thing with your own money. But but a lot of times I don't know that that's really good, right? I mean, I think if I took all of you know, if, if I if I had the money to totally fund a game myself, I don't know that that would necessarily produce the best game Could, because I think I think having a little bit of give and take, having that person out there that's you know playing the devil's advocate saying, "Ooh, have you really thought about this? Oh, I'm not really sure this is a good idea. I think you really need that. I think if you are left totally to your own devices, you you don't have the give and take that I think is really necessary, you know, in the creative process. You get blind after a while regarding your own stuff. Yeah, you do. You do. You do. Because you're, you're in a little bubble. You know, you're in this little bubble of yourself and um, you, you need outside input, you know, and you, know, you can do like play testing and that's one kind of input. But I don't think anything substitutes the input of, you know, your peers being able to look at the game, right? It's, it's easy to take input that play testers have given and go, okay, well, I'm going to ignore that because it's, you know, weird gamers that want, you know, things that are impossible from a game design standpoint. But when you're dealing with, you know, your peers that you respect – it's like when they're kind of picking your game apart, it's like you spend a lot more time listening to them and, and, and going, yeah, okay, maybe they're right. Maybe this, maybe I should do this differently. Um, and I, I think you, I think you really need that. And, you know, the publishers can provide that sometimes, you know, they can, they, they can, they can also be very frustrating because they might be coming about something from a business standpoint rather than a game design standpoint. And that could be very frustrating. But sometimes, you know, publishers do provide, you know, a really good give and take for stuff. So if, if you know, anybody is working without a publisher, find somebody that can give you that, that good pushback and give and take on your designs. That's a good advice. <laughs> so um, if you look back with the knowledge that you have nowadays, would you have changed something about Maniac Mansion, Monkey Island and all the other games? Would you have done something different on a retro perspective? 
Did I say that again? Was I, that I mean, I mean, again? with 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 the knowledge you have today, would you do games like Maniac Mansion and uh, and, and um, Monkey Island different on a retro perspective? Would you change anything with the, the, with the knowledge that you have yeah. nowadays? Yeah, um, you know, I think with Monkey Island, probably not. Um, I think with Maniac Mansion, you know, because Gary and I didn't really know what we were doing, we built a lot of dead ends into that game. You know, there's a lot of cases where you can get stuck and fail and not even know you're stuck, right? I mean, if you use the the paint remover on the plant, you're never going to be able to remove the paint, you know, on the wall to see the door. And you never know that, right? I mean, you could you play the game for 12 hours and not know that you're completely screwed because you got rid of the paint remover. You know, maniac mansion. I would, you know, I would do those things differently. You know, I would make the design a little less abusive. Um, but for me, for, for monkey Island, I don't know that there's much I would change. Right. I mean, I have a list of like nitpicks. I have a list of things I wish I would have done and, you know, puzzles that I wish I didn't have to cut. But at the end of the day, none of that stuff really mattered. And so I think I think that game I think that game I was very very happy with the way it is. Well, you could do it like uh, George Lucas, you know, Maniac oh, Mansion Revisited or something, you know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm <clears throat> I'm a, I'm a real opponent of remastering games. I just I do not think that that stuff should happen. Um, I think it's very important that that games are playable on modern platforms, but I really don't like this whole idea of going through and changing the graphics. To me, it's like, it's like this phase that black and white movies went through where they were colorized yeah. because people felt, Oh, well, an audience won't watch a black and white movie. So let's add this computerized, you know, coloring to the movie and turn it color. And that just, that whole thing just offended me. And that's, that's kind of the way I see, um, I see games that go through and redo all their graphics and stuff. It's like, oh, but no, it's like I I know how these games were built and they were built with this pixel art in mind. You know, it's it's how the artist conceived of all this stuff. And it's like a black and white movie was was shot for a reason. It was lit for a reason because it was in black and white and you can't just colorize that stuff away. And that's kind of the way I think about remastered games. Mm. So you're not you're not a fan of the remastered um, Monkey Island and so on that you can have on a. Well, on I like the iPhone fact that they that. can you can switch the graphics. Yeah. You can put it well, back to the way it used to, to be. That. Yeah, I th I think that I think that is really good that you can do that. But yeah. but it's not how I would have I would have done that stuff. Funny thing about the paint remover, by the way. The thing is that that most younger listeners don't know, but you only had one safe game on the C64 version. <laughs> That's right. So if well, you save after well, you made your you, mistake, you have well, you to replay have, you, the You can have more game save again. games. You can have more save games. You just need more floppy disks. Yeah, <laughs> well, who, who knew it at that time? Who knew it at that time? <laughs> you know, uh, floppy disks were expensive 30 years ago, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Thimbleweed Park has nine save slots, and I've, you know, I've I've heard people bitching about that. It's like, well, why doesn't Thimbleweed Park have unlimited save slots or ninety-nine save slots? And then somebody on somebody on the forums popped up and said, "Hey, Maniac Mansion had one save slot. Quit your bitching," you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's really interesting. But there's also you, you, I don't there's no you can't get stuck in it. There's no uh, it's not like there's a dead end where you can play yourself into a corner yeah no there isn't yeah well there's there's one place if you do something really really stupid that the game will end yeah. um but but the character even tells you you should probably save your game right now <laughs> right i mean that's how explicit the character is about that um but there are still people who 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 do do that weird convoluted action that they're warned about many 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 times that they should save the game and they don't save their game and they, and they are kind of screwed, and I guess I feel a little sorry for them, but they were told to save their game. <laughs> but don't you have autosave in it, in a way? It does have, it does have autosave. Um, but the, but the, the thing that happens in that particular instance, I won't spoil what that is, but what happens sure, in that don't. particular instance is they do the thing, and the game ends. It's kind of a joke. And the game ends... And then they still have their autosave, right? If they would just load their autosave at that moment, they would be fine. But instead, what they do is they panic. 
and they end up wrecking their autosave mm. because they panic and they start the game over and then the autosave gets overwritten or they do all this other stuff where so they just kind of relax and take a deep breath and go, ah, I've got my autosave. I'm okay. Then that, then that would work fine for them. Okay. So you, you already know the, well, the fine print in the game playing. So you, you are aware of what people are doing, the stupid actions. <laughs> That's yeah, I mean, most of that just comes from watching social media, right? I mean, it's watching Twitter and Facebook and all this stuff and just, you know, seeing people complain or reading the Steam forums and seeing somebody go, oh, my God, you know, I did this thing and my game ended and now I'm screwed and I've lost, you know, six hours of gameplay and, you know, stuff. So I think it's, you know, social media is a thing we didn't have, you know, back at Lucasfilm during Maniac Mansion or Monkey Island. You know, we, we had no social media, so it was like you build a game and you'd shove it into this black hole, you know, and then maybe three or four months later, you know, it would pop up when a magazine came out that had a review or maybe you'd get written letters from people about stuff. But other than that, we just we just never heard from players. We, we really <laughs> never knew what was happening with the players. I just imagine somebody who lost his life on Maniac Mansion didn't have a second disc for a safe game, and he was swearing himself, I'm not, never going to buy a Ron Gilbert game again. <laughs> and then he, then he saw Thimbleweed Park on Steam. Right. <laughs> and, 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 he, and, he, and he does the one thing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right, he does the one thing and doesn't load his autosave. It's like, damn, that Ron Gilbert, <laughs> never again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny gamer stories, yeah. Hmm. It's, it's really interesting. So you're really following your stuff. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. So so is there is there any other author that you look up to or really admire for for his work that he has done? Maybe besides um, Sierra that you had to well analyze as a job, you said. I just like game designers. Yes. People doing game design stuff. Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a really good question. Thank you. I don't think I, really, I don't think I don't think I've really thought about that. I don't know that I've thought about that, um, you know, t too much actually. So, so you you are your best uh, game designer. There's nobody that you that that's influenced you, kind of. Well, I mean, there's there's games that I find very influential, you know. But I, I don't know that I take it back to a particular person, right? I, I look I look at just games that I think, oh well, this this was a really good game. This is a really interesting and you know game, and you know I, I pull a lot from that. But I I don't know that I necessarily you know attribute it to a person or say, oh well, this person you know has 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 done something and and stuff. I, mean, I certainly know you know the people that were involved in games and you know, when they do games. But I, I think I'm very much of that model that I, I do tend to look at studios. You know, I really enjoyed Firewatch quite a bit, right? And, you know, I think the next thing that, you know, Campo Santos does, I'm certainly going to pay attention to it because I really enjoy Firewatch, you know, more than I am paying attention to the individual people that made Firewatch. Hmm. Good point. Uh, where can people go to find out more about Thimbleweed Park and, and what you're doing and... and and all that well if they go to thimbleweedpark.com then go to the website for the thing if they go to blog.thimbleweedpark.com they can read the whole development blog because we've blogged about the project you know since the kickstarter was launched we've done you know two or three posts every week since then and podcasts and all this other stuff so if you want to know about game design and the behind the scenes stuff then definitely go to blog.thimbleweedpark.com if you just want to know about the game, you can just go to thimbleweedpark.com. And you personally, I think you are on Twitter as Grumpy Gamer. <laughs> yes, Grump, Grumpy Gamer. It's my Twitter. I handle. wonder how did that happen? Were you <laughs> long... frustrated by playing your own games or something? <laughs> no, it's it's a long story that has absolutely nothing to do with me being grumpy. It's like I I started back in 2004. I started the my blog, and um. I thought it'd be really fun to do a blog. I was enjoy reading other blogs that other game developers did. And I thought, well, what should I call this blog? It's like, I need a URL for this blog. And I had registered grumpygamer.com 
back in like 1997, right? I had owned the Grumpy Gamer URL forever. And so I started my blog and I went, well, let me see what URLs I own. And I just happened to own grumpygamer.com. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll just do that. So that's kind of the whole story. It's just because I owned the URL. <laughs> Interesting, nice. And we'll put links um, to all these in the podcast description so yeah. people can check them out. So thanks a lot, Ron, for your time, even earlier than originally, um, well, appointed. That's, that's really great. Thank you a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's a lot of fun. Okay, so that was Ron Gilbert. Again, if you want to know more about the game, uh, go to www.thimbleweedpark.com. Or go to... Ron Gilbert's Twitter, which is at Crumby Gamers. Yes. Uh, as for us, you, you know us. I'm not going to say it again. Links to everything are in the description. And we will see you next time.